What is up? Good mic work. Back at you with episode 428. I'm up here as usual with your Raw and SmackDown reviews. To me, this week, much like last week, neither one of these shows really set the world on fire. Of course, SmackDown was a go-home show for the Backlash pay-per-view coming to us this Sunday on the WWE Network. I will predict that entire card here coming up later on. But as far as the Raw and SmackDown shows themselves go, I'm going to do just like what I've been doing in the past couple of weeks and just give a general rundown because nothing too crazy happened on either one of these shows, although there were a few notable things that we'll have to discuss. Throughout the duration of this commentary, you will also hear me touch on some other random wrestling news as well, which I should have printed up here on the screen for you, and maybe even some time codes down below. My attempt is to make this commentary just a tiny bit shorter than some of the commentaries you've heard from me lately, only because I have a lot of other projects that I'm working on this week and that I'm finishing up. Most notably, all of my re-uploads. As many of you know, WWE took down about a dozen or so of my videos a couple of months ago, including a lot of pay-per-view and DVD reviews, a couple of Q&As, and of course my big big WrestleMania memories commentary, and I've been working on re-uploading all of those to you. They're just about done. I only have like one DVD review left to do, and of course my WrestleMania memories commentary was pulled down way back, I think in October or November of last year, so it's been about six or seven months. And instead of breaking my back trying to get this thing re-uploaded, I've really been working on it just a little bit at a time, and I'm proud to say that I'm finally, finally, finally finished with this thing. I just need to add some comments, some bonus scenes for WrestleMania 32 and 33 onto the end of this thing and add a few bells and whistles and upload it and I'm done so it should be to you by this weekend along with any other DVD review that I'm still missing and need to re-upload. So I kind of want to get back focused on that and getting that shit out of my life. That way I can start focusing on my next big video project, which of course is my Q&A. I mentioned that in my last commentary. I've got plenty of questions now. I have more than enough. But if for any reason you want to send in a last minute one, I'll take a look at it. Maybe I'll include it. Maybe I won't. Please send your questions to goodmikework at gmail.com. My Q&As are email only. I cannot stress that enough. Everybody asks me where they can send questions to, and I've said it time and time again. It's email only. So send it to goodmikework at gmail.com. Email.com. Tell me your name and where you're from, and I'll do my best to use your question in a future Q&A. So once all these stupid re-uploads are done, I'm going to focus my energy on the Q&A and hopefully have that to you in the first week or two of June. So let's jump right into Raw and SmackDown now. I don't want to bore you too much with the channel announcements, but sometimes stuff like that needs to be said, and I need to inform you guys of what my plans are. So hopefully I didn't bore you too much, but why don't we dive right into Raw first. And this show, you know, I think I liked it a little bit better than the UK show, but still it wasn't one of the best Raws I've seen, and I found myself bored through some of it. But it was still, you know, there were still some notable things on here that I think are worth mentioning, specifically the big story that was floating around on Monday regarding Braun Strowman. Now, Kurt Angle opened up the show and announced that Braun Strowman had surgery and is expected to miss, get this, up to six months of action. WWE.com announced the same information earlier on in the day prior to Raw. So the big story on the internet is that Braun is going to be out six months. Now, half of the wrestling websites were reporting this as fact, and the other half saw through it. And I think the general consensus now is that most likely this is a kayfabe timetable here. And Braun Strowman is actually going to be back much, much sooner than that. Probably even four months sooner than that. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. Because I believe Braun Strowman had his surgery many days ago, way before Monday. So by then, you would think he had time to come out of surgery and to have his doctors evaluate him post-surgery and maybe get a better timetable on his return. Once the WWE heard what that return was, they went ahead and announced that he's going to be out for six months. That way, when they bring him back as a surprise and he shows up out of the blue, it's going to make him look even more superhuman and more of a monster than he already is. So I kind of like that plan, and that's what I'm hoping is the case here. I haven't heard any confirmation really on this one way or the other, but most people are assuming that this is a kayfabe injury and a kayfabe timetable and Braun Strowman's minor procedure that he had done on his elbow is only going to keep him out of action for four to eight weeks. So maybe, who knows, maybe he could even be healthy enough to do a run-in in three weeks, and he could do something at Extreme Rules. I think Great Balls of Fire is probably more likely for Braun Strowman, but, you know, if they were to bring him back even sooner, I mean, just imagine Roman Reigns. Imagine the look on his face. Imagine him thinking that he's rid of Braun Strowman at least for half a year, and three weeks later, this guy shows up completely healed, and 
and kicks the hell out of Roman Reigns, I mean, Roman would piss himself. So I'm really hoping that's what happens here. And whatever their future plans for Braun are, you know, you have to think that his title shot, if he's able to come back in four to eight weeks, his title shot would still happen. It might just be pushed back to SummerSlam. And that was a rumored match all the way in the beginning of the year. Braun Strowman versus Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. I thought Roman Reigns versus Brock would make more sense, especially since Roman Reigns was most likely going to end the career of The Undertaker at WrestleMania, but now we hear the stories that they want to hold that off until next year. So Braun Strowman is really the only guy. If it's not going to be Roman Reigns taking on Brock, Braun Strowman is really the only guy on the roster right now that would make the most sense, aside from a Finn Balor or a Seth Rollins, which we might still see prior to SummerSlam. So the good news about Braun's injury is that it allows them to not rush the title match with Brock, because I think initially this was penciled in for Great Balls of Fire. They can now push this back to SummerSlam, and that can be a pretty big marquee match on your card, I believe, especially if Braun Strowman comes back in a big way in July, mows through a couple of more people, maybe gets another victory over Roman Reigns or something like that, and goes into SummerSlam to face Brock in a confrontation that many fans have wanted to see for a while, and that the WWE has even teased a time or two. So, you know, hopefully that's the case here, because if not, and Braun Strowman is actually really going to miss up to six months of action, that is horrible. That feels like a kick in the teeth. That is the last thing in the world the WWE needs right now. So hopefully we're all keeping our fingers crossed that the WWE is just working us all here and they're going to bring Braun Strowman back as a surprise and he's going to show up randomly at Extreme Rules on Raw at Great Balls of Fire somewhere, interfere in a match, cost somebody something, and go on to have a pretty big match at SummerSlam against hopefully Brock Lesnar or maybe even Roman Reigns. It's looking right now that Braun Strowman should be back here within the middle of July or somewhere around that time. Let's all hope that that's the case. So get well soon, Braun Strowman. Getting back to Raw now, as Kurt Angle is in the ring announcing this Braun Strowman news to the fans, he also announces that at Extreme Rules, he's going to book a fatal five-way number one contender match to determine who will get the title shot against Brock Lesnar at Great Balls of Fire. That match is going to consist of Roman Reigns, Finn Balor, Samoa Joe, Seth Rollins, and Bray Wyatt. And I believe this is going to be a big no disqualification match or anything goes match or whatever because it's extreme rules. Now, Roman Reigns comes out first and tells Kurt Angle that he deserves a one-on-one shot against Brock because he ended the career of The Undertaker and he's it's his yard and all this shit. Finn Balor then comes out. Everybody comes out and says the exact same thing. Everybody thinks that they deserve a shot against Brock Lesnar when in reality they're all really getting an opportunity to face him. But every single one of them feel like they have an argument to face Brock Lesnar one-on-one, and when you look at it, they actually do. Uh, But it was kind of a dumb, pointless segment that ended in a brawl, and I think at the end of it, Finn Balor was left standing, and I think his music even played as they went to commercial or whatever. They come back, Kurt Angle is backstage, I think he's talking to a couple of the guys, and he's mad, and he's like, hey, you guys have all this aggression and anger to get out, why don't I book a couple of matches tonight? Seth Rollins, you're going to take on Bray Wyatt, and Finn Balor, you're going to face... Roman Reigns. Holy shit, here is that rematch that we've waited quite a while for, damn near a year, to get Roman Reigns versus Finn Balor again, and I was a little bit upset because I'm like, oh shit, you know Roman Reigns is going to get this win back. You know, you you have to know that because it's the only monkey on his back. It's the only person currently on the roster that he has not defeated. WWE is obviously building him towards next year's WrestleMania. He's going to face Brock, apparently, or at least that's the long-term plan, unless things change or somebody gets in injured or whatever, that's the match they're probably going to go with. And Finn Balor is the only guy on the roster that's really beat Roman clean that Roman has not defeated back. So I was worried. I'm like, oh shit, Roman Reigns is going to beat Finn Balor and the fans are going to lose their mind. Uh, Roman Reigns beating Finn Balor is not a travesty. Roman Reigns ended the career of The Undertaker. He's a three-time WWE champion. They've been pushing him to the moon ever since he arrived in the company as a member of The Shield. For a guy like this, for a top star, for the poster boy of the WWE, WWE to defeat Finn Balor is not a burial of Finn Balor. There's no shame in losing to a star the caliber of Roman Reigns, but I knew that that wasn't going to matter. The fans were going to bitch and moan and be pissed off anyway, and they were. They were all bitching about it. Oh, Roman Reigns is injured. His shoulder is taped up. How did he beat Finn Balor clean? Balor couldn't even beat an injured Roman Reigns. All the same shit that just makes no sense. There's really nothing wrong with this match or with Roman Reigns winning. It's just I wasn't ready to see it yet. I enjoyed that match 
match that they had last year. I loved watching Finn Balor beat Roman Reigns clean because that was right when Roman came back from his suspension, right? They took the belt off of him, suspended him for 30 days. He came back and then he had a job a couple of times and then they ended up putting the U.S. belt on him, I guess as punishment or whatever. So now all of that is water under the bridge. They went ahead and booked this match again for Raw and it was a good match, but it did see Roman Reigns getting the victory over Finn Balor clean. And it's really not something that I'm going to waste my time debating. I know fans are pissed just because they hate Roman Reigns, but really, the logic of it is not that ass backwards. This was not the worst thing that's ever happened. This wasn't a burial. This wasn't a travesty. It's not like Finn Balor is going to be wrestling on kickoff matches because he lost to Roman Reigns. I fully expect Finn Balor to be in the title mix from here on out. But the match itself with Roman did not really piss me off that bad, especially when you look ahead to Extreme Rules. I think there's a really good chance that Finn Balor wins that Fatal 5-Way and goes on to face Brock. I think Brock could either face Finn Balor at Great Balls of Fire, or I think Brock could face Finn Balor and Seth Rollins in a triple threat. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, that that would be a really fun match to do, because lately, in the past year or two, we've only seen Brock in the ring with Goldberg and The Undertaker and guys like that. He's rarely been in there with a smaller guy, except for Seth Rollins, who he's faced a couple of times. He had that one-on-one -on -one match with him at uh, Battleground, I believe, a couple of years ago. He was in the triple threat with Seth and Cena, which is a really good match at the Rumble a couple of years ago. So if they put Seth and Finn in the ring with Brock, that could be a different type of match where Brock Lesnar, with his two moves, is going to be forced to do something else different in that match to survive, and I think it could be a lot of fun. So if they figure out something to do at Extreme Rules where, you know, maybe somebody wins, but then somebody else works their way into the match as well, maybe Seth gets fucked over or screwed, Finn Balor wins the five-way, and then Seth finds a way to get into the match at Grey Balls of Fire a couple weeks later on Raw somehow in some sort of a storyline twist. They could do this a lot of different ways, but regardless what you think about Finn Balor losing to Roman Reigns, I don't think Roman Reigns is going to be the one to win the Fatal Five-Way. And when you look at it like that, he lost to Braun Strowman at Payback. He's now going to come up unsuccessful in the Fatal Five-Way. you got to give him a victory against somebody somewhere. So for him to beat Finn Balor on Raw, when you look ahead, I don't have that huge of a problem with it, and I'm not freaking out. Right now, I would think that Roman Reigns is an underdog to come out on top of that Fatal Five-Way because Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar at Great Balls of Fire doesn't make any sense if you hear the rumors about them holding off this big epic match until WrestleMania next year. Why in the world would you have this on a shitty pay-per-view in July with an even shittier name? And after Roman Reigns ends the career of The Undertaker, you decide to have this big epic rematch that we saw at WrestleMania a couple of years ago take place at Great Balls of Fucking Fire? Are you fucking crazy? No way. So right now, I do not see Roman Reigns winning this five-way. I think it comes down to Finn Balor or Seth Rollins or both. Uh, Samoa Joe would be very fun. I'd love to see Joe and Brock, and I think a lot of us would. But, you know, again, that's another match with two beefy guys. I'm sick of seeing Brock in matches like that. I want to see him work with somebody small, like a Shawn Michaels, like an AJ Styles, like a Seth Rollins, like a Finn Balor. Guys like that, I think, can give Brock a much better match. We've seen that before with Seth Rollins. We've seen it with CM Punk. How good was that CM Punk match with Brock at SummerSlam a few years ago? That was great stuff. So I want to see Brock work with one of those two guys. It would be a little bit hard to believe for Finn Balor to get in there with Brock. I mean, Finn is a very small guy. He's a hell of an athlete, great wrestler, one of my favorites they have on the roster right now currently. But believability-wise, he's about the size of Brock's leg. So, you know, I know size doesn't always matter, and a good little man can always beat a good big man, and all of those cliches, but still, realistically, you know, if you're watching this match as a casual fan, who the fuck thinks that Finn Balor is going to beat Brock Lesnar? So it'll be really interesting to see at Extreme Rules who winds up winning this thing and how, and since I don't expect it to be Roman Reigns, I'm curious how he winds up not winning. This is not an elimination match, correct? This is just a straight-up Fatal Five-Way Extreme Rules match, one fall for the winner, correct? So unless I'm wrong about the elimination thing, I'm curious to see how they book the finish of this thing and what happens to Roman Reigns. Maybe, just maybe, we'll see Braun Strowman as early as Extreme Rules. Or maybe, just maybe, even though I said I see no way Roman Reigns can win this match, maybe he does. Maybe he does go in to Great Balls of Fire to face Brock and Braun Strowman interferes in that match somehow setting up his match with Brock at SummerSlam or maybe even a three-way 
between the three monsters at SummerSlam. That could always be a direction they go as well, although I really wouldn't want to see that. Putting Brock and Roman together in July at Great Balls of Fire, to me, makes no sense whatsoever. Brock needs to have a different match with a different opponent, and that's what I'm hoping that they set up at Extreme Rules. So I think the match should be interesting. I'm sure the match will be good. I'm not a huge fan of the big multi-man matches, but lately, you know, with what these guys are capable of, they're getting better and better. I'll never forget that Survivor Series match last year that went like an hour long. That was great. So I think this Fatal 5-Way can be a lot of fun. It needs to be because they have to make up for the fact that there's no universal title on the line. There's no Brock Lesnar. There's no Braun Strowman. So you have to do what you have to do to make this pay-per-view good and successful and putting these five guys together in a big Extreme Rules match, Fatal 5-Way, number one contender match, I think can be fun. And I think they'll come up with a lot of creative ways to make this match and this pay-per-view good. So I'm wishing everybody luck in the main event and world title situation. And I really hope it comes off well. Uh, The other match that Kurt Angle made that I mentioned was Bray Wyatt versus Seth Rollins. I believe that was the main event. Seth Rollins wound up winning that match via disqualification. Samoa Joe came out and attacked Seth Rollins, and Bray Wyatt helped him. And the two of them together start beating the hell out of Seth. And then Bray nails Joe with the sister Abigail and stands tall as the show goes off the air. So I kind of like that, that there's kind of no friends here. And seeing Bray Wyatt and Samoa Joe mix it up a little bit was really interesting to watch. So I kind of like the way the show went off the air with uh, Bray Wyatt kind of kicking everybody's ass. Now, the other big match that took place on Raw was the Intercontinental title match with The Miz and Dean Ambrose that they actually announced last week. So this was advertised. We knew it was going to happen. I suggested a couple of different finishes to this match, and I kind of even predicted this right. I had a feeling that they would, whatever they did in this match, it would be to set up a rematch at Extreme Rules, and the most likely place for a title change would be Extreme Rules because, like I said, there's no universal title on the line here. It's not being defended. Brock isn't even working the show, and Braun Strowman is off injured, so you might have to have some sort of major thing happen as far as the title change goes at Extreme Rules, and I thought the Intercontinental title would be better served changing hands at that show, and that's pretty much what they did. The Miz wins via disqualification. Dean Ambrose hangs on to the title. I mentioned a scenario kind of like that in my last commentary, and backstage the Miz is bitching and complaining to Kurt Angle, says that he wants a rematch, and Kurt Angle says, fine, you get a rematch at Extreme Rules, and I'll even make a stipulation that if Dean Ambrose gets disqualified, you win the belt. So there you go. I'm predicting right now the Miz to win the Intercontinental title at Extreme Rules. It seems like it only makes sense, especially with the stipulation that Dean could get disqualified and still lose it. That could be a really douchey, heelish way for Miz to win the title, and it could even, you know, result in another rematch between the two before Miz goes off and does something else. And I think Extreme Rules is going to need a major title change. Not that there's not opportunities for that. We also have the Cruiserweight title, the Tag title, and the Ladies title all being defended on the pay-per-view. But I think the Intercontinental title should probably change hands at Extreme Rules just to give the show something to be remembered by. And speaking of the Intercontinental title, I was surfing through YouTube and just listening and watching a bunch of random videos, and I happened to stumble across a clip from Dave Meltzer's latest podcast episode or whatever it is he does, and he was talking about the Intercontinental title and the situation that it's in on Raw and what we saw, and he brought up a couple of interesting points that I actually really agree with, but also disagree with at the same time. It's kind of weird. Basically what he was saying is that by default, or you know indirectly, this Fatal 5-Way match for the number one contender spot is devaluing the Intercontinental title. Because when you look at this, you have five guys involved in this match. Kurt Angle is announcing all the participants, and none of them are Dean Ambrose. None of them are the Intercontinental champion. Dean Ambrose just came out on Raw a couple of weeks ago and pretty much declared that Raw's main title was the Intercontinental title because Brock is sitting his ass at home. And when you look throughout history, before the Intercontinental title really started declining in value, you know, the IC champion was also always the number two guy in the company. I remember that from being a kid. I remember going back and reading the magazines, the old uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazines, and in the back of it, or somewhere in there, every week or every month, they were would rank all of the wrestlers in each promotion, WCW, WWE, NWA, whatever. And whenever you looked at the WWE rankings, you know, number one was always your world champion and number two was always your intercontinental champion. What is the motivation for wrestlers to want to go out and win the intercontinental title if it's just a mid-card title? If they want the intercontinental title to mean more, they need to treat it as if it's the number two title in the company. And for about one or two weeks there, it looked like they were actually going to do that. But with Dean being involved 
involved in this shit with the Miz, it kind of leaves him out in the cold. He's not even in the running to get a shot at the Universal title at Great Balls of Fire. And as a result, it pretty much devalues the Intercontinental title. Now, I completely agree with Meltzer's opinion on that, but at the same time, you have to look at the pay-per-view. I've been saying it time and time again, Brock is not here. We have no world title match on this card. So I think they have to put Dean in a one-on-one match for the title just so you can have a major title defended and even change hands on the show. So that's the only reason why I would disagree with Melter's viewpoint on that because I think you need to have the IC belt defended on the show since there is no world title defended. Now, if Brock was there and defending the universal title, then fine. you got to throw Dean into that fatal five-way. It would only make sense. But since Brock is not there, Dean has to defend the title so they can have something major like that happen. And that's why I'm predicting the Miz to win. He's going to break some records by holding the title seven times, eight times, whatever it is. All of that is great, but still it doesn't do a whole lot to elevate the title, especially when it's so separated from the universal title and all of the top contenders. It's basically just a mid-card title, and I would like that to change. Some of the other notable things on Raw, we had yet another one-on-one match involving Sheamus and Cesaro and one of the Hardys. This time it was Jeff taking on Sheamus. And Jeff beat him. And I got to ask you, have the Hardys lost at all since they've come into the WWE? They've won every tag match and every singles match that they have had. I know Matt's won all his singles matches and Jeff has won all of his. And I haven't seen him lose at all yet. So you'd think they're ripe. They're way overdue for a loss. There's no more news or new information that I'm aware of regarding the Broken Matt character and whatever's going on with Impact Wrestling and WWE. Still, nothing has really worked out there. And for right now, we can forget about those broken characters showing up on WWE television. So at some point, you got to think that Jeff and Matt need to drop these belts. And I think Extreme Rules can be a good place for that. I do believe that match has been announced now. If it hasn't, it probably will be next week. But Sheamus and Cesaro will be getting a title shot against the Hardy Boys. I'm not sure what the stipulation is yet at this time either, but whatever it is, I would think, considering how much the Hardy Boys have been winning, that Sheamus and Cesaro really need to take the titles from them at Extreme Rules. So my predictions won't be coming for another week or two, but right now I'm predicting The Miz and Cesaro and Sheamus to all win belts at Extreme Rules. We had another Alexa Bliss promo where she brilliantly shut down the what chance again. I think they're whatting her, and she says, uh, if you're a failure, say what? And of course, they all say what? And I don't know what took them so long to think of this. I have no idea why a wrestler has never pulled this shit with the what chance before. Alexa Bliss is actually the first one to do it. Why they didn't think of this 15 years ago, I have no idea, but... The way she brilliantly shuts those down and she deals with them, uh, she almost likes them. And I think it might become a thing. I think we might start hearing fans what her even louder just so she can shut them down every week and come up with a different insult or a different saying that can get a chuckle out of all of us. So she's in there bitching about Bailey or talking shit about Bailey. Bailey comes out and says that she's invoking her rematch clause against Alexa at Extreme Rules. And Alexa goes on to say that... She's just a dumbass little kid whose ponytail is tied too tight and there's no way that she can get extreme and there's no way she has a dark side or anything like that and can't get violent and then proceeds to beat the shit out of her with a kendo stick that she has hiding under the ring and Bailey is, you know helped off to the back after the beatdown with the kendo stick. She's then backstage getting checked out by the doctors, holding her shoulder. Kurt Angle comes in and announces that at Extreme Rules, it'll be Bailey versus Alexa Bliss in a kendo stick on a pole match. I think that they could have gotten a little bit more creative with this match. I am not a big fan of anything on a pole, and now it's going to be a kendo stick, but is this really extreme? I mean, come on. I mean, the ladies, I know, they can't go too crazy there, but we've had Hell in the Cell matches before, for fuck's sake. And there's some decent bad blood between Bailey and Alexa. You would think that they could come up with something a little bit more hardcore than a kendo stick on a pole match. I would even like to see Mick Foley show back up on WWE TV between now and Extreme Rules, or maybe just be hiding out in the backstage area and Bailey is like walking by in the hallway and he's like, Psst, come here, Bailey, come here. And she goes, Mick, what are you doing here? And he calls her into the corner or calls her into her room and wishes her luck in her match with Alexa at Extreme Rules and says, hey, I think you might need this. And he gives her a Cactus Jack t-shirt and maybe she puts it on and wears it at the pay-per-view and, you know, channels her inner Mick Foley because remember, Mick Foley is a very fun-loving, very nice guy, almost too nice for the wrestling business, much like Bailey. They have a lot in common, but when they want to get nasty, they can get nasty, and we've seen Mick Foley do some pretty crazy shit in some of his alter egos, so if he kind of rubs some of that a little bit on Bailey, maybe she can go out at Extreme Rules 
you know, with a fire lit under her and she can get a little crazy and she can just beat the hell out of Alexa with that kendo stick. I wish it, I wish it wasn't a kendo stick. I wish it was a baseball bat or I wish this was a false count anywhere match or a no disqualification match or a, a tables match, something where, you know, something a little bit more violent can happen, I guess. You think about some of the things that Charlotte and Sasha did last year. They had the hell in the cell and then they had the false count anywhere match. I mean, both of those matches were going to be, were pretty tough to top. So I don't know what in the hell Alexa and Bailey can do in a kendo stick on a pole match. Um, and another interesting women's match, Alicia Fox beat Sasha Banks in a match clean, totally clean, totally random. I don't think Alicia Fox has won a match in the WWE in over two years, or at least a one-on-one -on -one match on Raw. I forgot what the stat was that I read, but it's been a couple of years since Alicia has even won anything on Monday Night Raw. So the fact that she beat Sasha here, I don't know. To me, this sounds like, or it seems like it's more of a way to set up Sasha's inevitable heel turn that we've been waiting for forever. I I think this is more of them positioning Sasha for the heel turn than it is pushing Alicia Fox, is what I would guess. Speaking of heel turns, we saw Goldust turn on R-Truth. How awesome was that? They've kind of been teasing this in the past few weeks with them losing a couple of matches and R-Truth apologizing and all of that. You could kind of see this coming. They come out to the ring on Raw, R-Truth starts doing his thing on the mic, and then Goldust attacks him from behind and kicks the crap out of him. Hopefully, this is something that they can actually follow through with, and hopefully they can do more more with gold dust here because I would love for him to have one final good run. I mean, if he's going to hang it up, if he's going to be retiring soon, they might want to turn him heel and have one more final run for Goldust, have him get some victories, maybe even put a title belt on him. If The Miz winds up winning the Intercontinental title at Extreme Rules, I would love to see Goldust win that belt one more time, even if it's just for a month. Just for old time's sake, because Goldust, I think, even wore the old Intercontinental belt with the white strap years ago, like 20 years ago, when he held that title. So to see him hold that again, I think would be pretty fun. However, every time I suggest WWE do something nice for a wrestler's final run, they never do. I was saying at WrestleMania that Mark Henry should win the Andre the Giant Battle Royal, and that should be his final match. He should win the match, get the trophy, and then get on the mic and say that was it. He's retiring and kind of go out on top. But the WWE just never seems to do that. So Every time I have some great idea for an aging veteran who's about to retire, WWE never does what I want them to do. So hopefully this gold dust heel turn actually amounts to something meaningful and it doesn't just amount to a bunch of matches with R-Truth on kickoff shows. So it was good to see gold dust turn heel. He is so underrated and Dustin at his age to still be in there performing in that level, I think is awesome. Remember a few years ago when he was teaming with Cody Rhodes and they won the tag team belts? Even back then, I thought gold dust was too old to be in the ring, but he was performing at an amazing level, probably much in thanks to DDP Yoga, which I know that he does and has really extended the careers of a lot of veterans in pro wrestling. So Goldust, I think, just for who he is, who his family is, who his father is, and his legacy in the business, and how he made that Goldust character work, and it's really a 21-year-old character, or 22, he debuted that character, I think, in October of 95. So we're going on 22 years of Goldust. You know, there were some breaks in between. I know he went to WCW. I think he went to TNA. He was in and out a few times. But, you know, Goldust has been around for over 20 years, for over two decades. And I think Dustin deserves to go out on a high note if this, in fact, is his final run in the company. I mean, I think it should be. I think they should do something fun with Goldust here. Give him some memorable moments. Give him a few victories and, uh, you know, have him retire and then move to a backstage role or go uh, work with the kids in NXT at the Performance Center or do something behind the scenes where all of his knowledge can be uh, more useful than just hanging out with our truth and doing goofy-ass backstage segments on Raw. So whatever they do with Goldust, I hope it's meaningful. As far as what else we saw on Raw, Neville and TJP beat Jack Gallagher and Austin Aries in a tag team match, which was just more set up to Neville and Aries match at Extreme Rules for the Cruiserweight belt. And we saw Cass beat Titus O'Neil uh, in a suit because I think Titus didn't know he was going to be wrestling and then it turned out he had to be Cass's opponent and he wrestled in a suit. Cass beat him rather easily and then Enzo thought it was funny and tried to take a selfie after the match and Apollo Crews kicked him upside his head, which I kind of got a kick out of that. So that's pretty much Raw in a nutshell. Uh, why don't we move on to SmackDown now and I won't spend too much time on that and then I'll go ahead and predict Backlash 
Now, SmackDown opened up with Kevin Owens uh, hosting the highlight reel, which was pretty funny. He was interrupted by AJ Styles, who was then interrupted by Jinder. They all have a few words, and Jinder Mahal and AJ Styles actually open up the show in the opening match after the big promo. Jinder Mahal beats AJ Styles, which I think was a good move. That's something that they need to do. He's got a title shot coming up this Sunday. He needs some more momentum. And they had Kevin Owens out there on commentary. So the minute you saw Kevin Owens sitting there, and you know him and AJ have got a big match coming up at back. Backlash. The finish was given away. I'm like, well, fuck. Kevin Owens is going to jump off headset. He's going to interfere in the match. And Jinder is probably going to get the victory. And that's exactly what happened. So hopefully, much like the Roman Reigns and Finn Balor situation, people weren't bitching too bad about this. I don't think Jinder beating AJ Styles in this way was really that big a deal. Jinder's getting a title shot in five days. He needs a big victory. And AJ Styles is a former champion. And it's a nice feather in his cap. And he had the victory uh, over Randy Orton last week in that tag team affair. So, yeah, putting gender over here made the most sense and it can still further everything for AJ and Owen since there was interference involved anyway. So AJ Styles losing to me wasn't the end of the world at all and I had no problem whatsoever with it. Uh, we saw another Fashion Files segment with uh, Brizongo which these are really funny and really entertaining, I'll admit it. I really want the Usos to retain because as much as I love Brizongo, I don't know. I think I love the Usos more but the segment was so funny. They're undercover and uh, Tyler Breeze comes in in a, like a janitor's outfit and they're talking about all these things that they found and I remember when uh, Tyler Breeze said look at these Baron Corbin shirts that I found he has three shirts and they're all wolves and then they pull out the Uso shirt and they're like what the hell does this mean what the hell does day one is H mean <laughs> which I just laughed and uh, I also got a kick out of it when Fandango uh, asked Tyler Breeze how the Recogni uh, how's the Recogni uh, the recog how's the undercover work going he couldn't even say it so really funny segment there those are pretty entertaining I will admit and I've pretty much gotten a chuckle out of everyone that they've done uh, they went then went out to the ring and had a match with the Colognes which they also won and uh, another great Usos promo was followed by this the Usos came out out to the stage just like last week cut one of their great promos on Brizongo basically telling him that they have no chance whatsoever to win the titles at Backlash and I made a tweet that I hope the Usos retain and it got absolutely zero reaction fucking crickets from you guys I think I'm one of the only ones that wants the Usos to beat Brizongo here I think a lot of people are on the fashion police bandwagon right now as am I it's just I'm not ready to see them win yet I think they could I mean these guys have paid their dues they've been put through a lot of shit since they They've come into the company and they've only had glimpses of greatness here or there, but really they've been treated like complete and total jokes. So the fact that they're actually getting a little bit of a push now and a title shot, I'm all for, but I think maybe they hold it off a little bit longer. The Usos retain at Backlash and then Brizongo maybe wins the belts uh, at a future date, maybe another SmackDown in a couple of weeks or the pay-per-view after that. Maybe eventually put the titles on Brizongo, just not quite yet is what I'm thinking. Uh, we saw the ladies, the six women that are going to be involved in the three-on-three -three tag team match at Backlash. They had a contract signing here, which just seems silly, that ended with Naomi and Carmella kind of getting into it. Shane McMahon then makes the match one-on-one, -on -one, Carmella versus Naomi, and the smoke clears, and Carmella rolls up Naomi, pins her one, two, three, and gets the victory there. The main event of the evening was Randy Orton taking on Baron Corbin in a really good one-on-one -on -one match. I like these two guys together. I think they work well together. Randy Orton beat him clean with the RKO. Jinder Mahal came out to the ramp and started cutting a promo after the match. Randy Orton was then jumped from behind by the Singh brothers, and then all three of them proceeded just to kick the shit out of Randy Orton with Jinder Mahal standing over Randy Orton holding the belt, and the show goes off the air. So that was a pretty good way to end the show heading into Backlash, because I really don't expect Jinder Mahal to win the title of Backlash. So he got a few victories under his belt. He beat Randy Orton. He beat AJ Styles. He stole the WWE title, and he kicked the crap out of Randy Orton in the go-home show, and now he can go on to Backlash to get RKO'd and pinned, at least I hope. So that was pretty much your SmackDown in a nutshell there. So let's go ahead now and predict this Sunday's Backlash pay-per-view. Now, including the kickoff match, I have eight matches written down for this card. So hopefully I'm not forgetting anything or I'm not missing anything. But according to what I have here, we'll start with the kickoff match. Ty Dillinger taking on Aiden English. Of course, I'm going to pick Ty Dillinger in this match. I suppose they could do an upset here. But it's a kickoff match. Ty just got to the main roster. He's over. WWE is trying to establish him. So I don't see any reason for him to lose at this point. So I'm going to predict him to defeat Aiden English on the kickoff. In the most recent match booked for this card, we have Eric Rowan taking on Luke Harper. Now, this match was made on Talking Smack. Did anybody see Eric Rowan's appearance on Talking Smack? Holy shit. 
That is exactly what I wanted to see out of Eric Rowan. This guy has been completely useless, completely meaningless. He is basically a jobber. I have never cared anything about him. I've never been a fan of his work, his look, his in-ring work, nothing. I literally care zero about this guy. However, part of the reason why I care so little about him is because we don't know him. He hasn't been able to connect with fans at all. We haven't been able to get an idea of who this guy is. He's just been a creepy looking guy that's been associated with the Wyatt family. Well, he appears on Talking Smack and oh my god. Even the Ultimate Warrior, if he was alive today, would look at this promo and say, that guy's out of his fucking mind. I mean, I didn't even know what he was saying. All I knew it was great. And he was very, you know, I, I, he was very bizarre. And the best part about this little interview is that Renee Young and Shane McMahon really did a good job of putting him over and selling him. I mean, they looked legitimately spooked. Renee Young and Shane both got up out of their chairs. They looked like they were about to hightail it out of there. Renee Young had a legitimately concerned look on her face, like she looked straight up scared. And Shane McMahon was kind of standing up, and he was very cautious, and he was very wary, and he was kind of looking around like, do I need to prepare to defend myself here? Is this guy going to snap? Is he going to go nuts? And all Eric Rowan was doing was trying on different sheep's masks and just talking out of his ass and doing it really well. I mean, he came across as a crazy person really well. He's got a good look for a crazy person. He's actually a pretty good talker, even if you write for him a bunch of gibberish. And I liked the whole thing. And this is exactly what I think somebody like Eric Rowan and needs. Part of the reason why nobody gives a shit about him is because the WWE doesn't give him any time or doesn't invest anything in him to get over as a character. Now, if we're starting to peer a little bit into what this character actually is, you know, this could only be the beginning here. So when you look at him taking on Luke Harper at Backlash, as much as I love Luke Harper, and I think he's poorly used as well, we were all hoping that Luke would be a part of the world title picture on SmackDown, and that never really came to be. So as much as I love Luke Harper and I want him to win pretty much every match that he's in, I actually am going to root for Eric Rowan in this match, and I'm going to predict him to win, because if Eric Rowan now goes into backlash and loses to Luke Harper, what was the point of all of that shit on Talking Smack? It looks like they're trying to take this guy that they have on the roster that they're paying a lot of money to, and actually doing something with him. That's actually what you want to do, and we've seen that a lot on SmackDown lately, with guys like Jinder Mahal getting title shots and Brizongo, and now Eric Rowan's another guy just sitting there that the WWE is going to try to do something with. At least that's what it seems. So I think that promo on Talking Talking Smack or that interview that he did could only be the tip of the iceberg and hopefully he'll beat Luke Harper at Backlash and then go on to do more significant things. If not, the whole thing is just going to fizzle out and die, but I think he made a lot of waves. He got a lot of people talking. People were talking about it on Twitter. A lot of the wrestling fans, from what I've seen, really enjoyed his little interview there. and It's something that we have not seen from Eric Rowan yet, and it was a good idea for the WWE to do that and try to get the fans to understand what this character is, even though we don't. Just give him some more interview time. Let his character, let his charisma, so to speak, or his, uh, or his ability to talk, let that shine, let that come out, and maybe you can build yourself a star here. Who knows? You know, they got a little bit of work to do to rebuild this guy and get the fans to give a shit about him, but this could be a good start, and now if he goes into backlash to defeat Luke Harper, that could be the beginning of great things for Eric Rowan. So who knows where they're going to go with this in the future. This could either turn out to be very, very successful, or WWE could fuck it all up. All I know is I really enjoyed his appearance on Talking Smack. That was some crazy shit. If you have not seen it, please go up on the network and check it out. It's well worth it, and uh, very crazy crazy. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that he defeats Luke Harper, so I'm going to predict him. Uh, the six ladies tag team match, this is a match that I care very, very little about, but I'm going to pick the baby faces because the welcoming committee has pretty much owned Becky Lynch and Charlotte and Naomi every week on SmackDown and every segment or match that they're in, so you think the baby faces have got to get a victory here, so I predict Naomi and Charlotte and Becky to get the win. In easily the most predictable match on the card, we've got Dolph Ziggler taking on Shinsuke Nakamura. This is going to be his in-ring debut on the SmackDown brand, and how can you pick anything other than him to win this match? I mean, Dolph Ziggler, I suppose WWE could swerve us and have Dolph win, but I don't see that happening. I think Dolph is going to go out there and give Shinsuke a really good match. I think Dolph is the perfect first opponent for Shinsuke, to be honest with you. I haven't been a big fan of what they've been doing on TV during the build to this match, but the match itself should be pretty good and should really be able to showcase what Shinsuke can do for those fans out there that might not watch a lot of NXT or might not be that familiar with him. They're going to get familiar with him when he works with Dolph and Dolph sells his ass off. So I'm picking Shinsuke Nakamura to easily defeat, well maybe not easily, the match is going to be a hard fought match, but you know Nakamura is going to get his hand raised at the end of this thing. We've got Baron Corbin taking on Sami Zayn, and here's a random one that I'm just going to throw out there. I'm picking Sami. I think most people might be picking Baron Corbin to win this match, but Sami kind of needs a victory. Baron Corbin just got 
RKO'd and pinned by Randy Orton. I really like Baron Corbin. I still think he can be champion one day, at least United States champion, at some point in the WWE and maybe even get some world title shots in the future. But Sami Zayn, he seems like he could use a big pay-per-view victory, and I don't think it would really hurt Corbin that much. All of my instincts are telling me that Corbin is going to win at Backlash, but I'm going to predict Sami Zayn just for the hell of it. And uh, I think the babyface picks up a win in this one. The Usos, of course, are defending the tag team titles against Brizongo. As much as I love Brizongo, like I talked about earlier, and all of their funny-ass sketches and their opportunity, I mean, these guys have paid a lot of dues to finally start winning some matches and getting some title shots, but I don't think I'm ready to see them win the belts yet, so I'm going to pick the Usos. Maybe Brizongo could win the belts in the future or at the next pay-per-view or something like that, maybe even on SmackDown on one random episode in a main event or, or whatever, but I don't think that they're going to win the titles of Backlash and I think the Usos are going to retain. I'm a big fan of the Usos. AJ Styles versus Kevin Owens for the United States title. This one's tough, but I think I'm going to pick... Kevin Owens to retain. You know, and I'm I'm cautious about doing that because I think we really need to see a major title change. I would love to see AJ win the United States title, and I think he will. I think he will eventually defeat Kevin Owens for the belt, but part of me thinks that Owens is going to win the first match. I mean, think about it. Owens just dropped the United States title at payback. So if he has another pay-per-view match and drops the title again, you know, then what do you do? I mean, I know he gets a rematch clause and him and AJ can work a couple of shows together and a couple of pay-per-views. This is a feud that I'm hoping stretches through at least the middle of the summer and maybe they can finally blow it off or be done with each other by the time we get to SummerSlam. But I don't really mind seeing these guys work a lot in the next few months. So I think... It could go either way here, and uh, my instincts, much like the Sami Zayn Baron Corbin match, my instincts want to pick AJ Styles, but I'm going to pick Kevin Owens. And it might not even be a victory. Kevin Owens might not even win. All I know is I think he will walk out a backlash with the United States title. So maybe AJ wins in a disqualification, Owens runs away or something, or gets counted out or whatever, and he keeps the belt, allowing AJ to come out on TV the next night or on Tuesday and demand a rematch at the next pay-per-view or on SmackDown or something like that. And Shane grants him that, and then he wins the United States title at a later date. So at least for backlash, I'm going to predict Kevin Owens to hang on to the title. Main event, of course, is Randy Orton defending the WWE title against Jinder Mahal. Now, I talked about Jinder earlier on. I just, you know, like I said, I hate to hate this guy. I really do. I want to like him. I'm happy that WWE is giving guys that would normally not get opportunities new opportunities with this brand split. SmackDown seems like they're doing that a lot more than Raw. So I can't say that I'm upset that WWE is trying some new things with some new guys. Guys, but I'm not really ready to see Jinder Mahal win the WWE title. And given what we've seen on TV in the past few weeks between these two guys, I really don't think Jinder is going to get another one up and actually take the title off of Randy Orton. I just do not see that happening. So I'm going to predict that Randy Orton retains the WWE title against Jinder Mahal. So just to recap, I've got Ty Dillinger, Eric Rowan, Naomi Charlotte and Becky, Shinsuke Nakamura, Sami Zayn, The Usos, Kevin Owens, and Randy Orton all picking up victories. Let me count. How many heels and baby faces is that? Uh, we've got one, we've got two, three, four, five. I'm going with five baby face victories and three heel victories. So we'll see how my predictions do on Sunday. As of right now, I am scheduled to be home for Backlash to live tweet and all of that. And I will be up later that night with a results and reaction video. However, there is a slight chance I could miss the show and I might have to watch it later. I'm not quite sure yet, but hopefully I will be up here on Sunday live tweeting with all of you. Other than that, I've just got a couple of other things written down that I should mention. Uh, there's the big UK Championship special this Friday on the WWE Network. Tyler Bate has got a big UK Championship title defense on that show, and Jim Ross will be calling the action with Nigel McGuinness, so that should be pretty cool. I will definitely check that out this weekend and give you some comments on it in my next commentary. Also, it should be noted here that NXT has got a pay-per-view this weekend as well, NXT TakeOver Chicago, coming to us on Saturday night. Now, I apologize for not talking about NXT as much as I would like. I wish I could talk about this more. Uh, it's such an awesome brand. There's so much great wrestling there, and I have a hard time kind of keeping up with it. I know I talk about NXT from time to time if I happen to catch one of their episodes, and I always discuss the NXT TakeOver specials, but I really need to do a better job of talking about NXT more. But, you know, the NXT TakeOver on Saturday night, I will wind up watching. I probably won't be able to watch it live, but I'll definitely catch the replay, or I'll catch it maybe on Sunday afternoon before Backlash. But we have the NXT title 
on the line, Bobby Roode taking on Hideo Itami. Asuka is defending the Women's Championship in a triple threat against Ruby Riot and Nikki Cross. The Authors of Pain are defending their tag team titles against DIY, and there are a lot of rumors out there that DIY might actually split up, and Gargano might be the one to actually turn heel, because apparently somebody's working on some new theme music for him or something. So we'll have to wait and see there if those rumors come to fruition. We've got Tyler Bate defending the UK Championship against Pete Dunne. Now, Tyler Bate, I think, has got a title defense on the UK special on the WWE Network the day before. From what I understand, I think those matches are already taped, so he'll have another title match essentially the next day, uh, taking on Pete Dunne there. I expect that he would win that. And Roderick Strong, a guy who WWE or NXT is really trying to introduce to the fans and let the fans get to know this guy a little bit more, he's taking on Eric Young. So on paper, the card looks pretty decent. All these shows are generally just two hours long, but they're always very good, and I'm definitely going to be checking out NXT TakeOver this Saturday night. And the final thing I'll mention very briefly here is the Twitter beef between Randy Orton and Bubba Ray Dudley that took place following Ring of Honor's big War of the Worlds pay-per-view or whatever it was. Now, this was all started by something that I didn't even notice. When I first noticed this on Twitter, I thought this was all between Randy Orton and Bubba Dudley. I had no idea that the origin of this actually came from Rip Rogers. Now, Rip Rogers sent out a tweet where he put out a very funny, to be honest, I mean, a very comical critique of what indie wrestling has become today. And I would love to read it to you, but I can't. I guess unless I pull it up on my phone, I could see it. But the thing is, is I never saw this tweet from Rip Rogers. You want to know why? Because once I finally heard about it and went to Rip Rogers' Twitter page to check it out, he's blocked me. The motherfucker blocked me. I've never even mentioned this asshole's name. I've never even laid eyes on his Twitter account ever, and somehow I'm blocked. So I don't know if maybe he read something I said one time and just didn't like it. I certainly never said anything about him. I've never cared about him enough to even tweet about him. So why the hell would he block me? So the only thing I can think of is maybe he came across one of my tweets where I expressed an opinion. He didn't like it, and he blocked me. I really have no idea why. That's the only thing I can think of. So I was not able to see this tweet but I was able to read it after the fact, and I invite you to go check out Rip Rogers' Twitter page, and you'll see it up there, and you'll read it, and it's pretty funny, especially the way he describes how independent wrestling matches generally go. You know, first it's the big yay-boo spot, and a shake of the hands, and then a long, drawn-out, you know, a mat wrestling exchange, followed by this is awesome chance, followed by 25 super kicks, followed by a headbutt, a dive, 13 kickouts of finishers, more this is awesome chance, followed by a roll-up for the pin, and then a shake of the hands, a show of respect, a hug at the end and then both guys go on Twitter and put the other ones over how great it was to work for them and that all other promoters should take notice and book their opponent. So it was kind of a funny little paragraph or two about how he, you know, kind of critiques and uh, you know, insults really independent wrestling. Now this is just two different generations talking here. I mean, somebody like him you know, an old timer like this, a washed up veteran who was really never more than a glorified jobber anyway, a lot of guys like this really have a problem with what wrestling has become. A lot, Especially with the fact that a lot of smaller guys are now so popular and they're doing things in the ring that we've never seen and uh, they're just little they're just little wrestlers and a lot of these old school guys don't know how to embrace the changes in the business you know to me I'm an old school guy I grew up on Dusty Rhodes and Superstar Billy Graham but even I can appreciate what these matches give to the fans because independent wrestling right now I think is about as hot as it's ever been or at least that is that it's been in a long long time so any progression of the business or positive attention on the business to me is a good thing. As long as the business continues to evolve, continues to have fans that care about it and are passionate about it, I really don't care. So for a lot of these old timers that claim to love pro wrestling, they should be happy that guys like this are creating such a buzz in the independent wrestling community. So even though what Rip Rogers said wasn't technically wrong, it's from a point of view that is biased because he clearly doesn't like today's wrestling and what wrestling has become, and there's a lot of other guys like him out there. Now, Randy Orton apparently read this and retweeted it, and that's where the whole thing came from. I thought Randy Orton had put in his two cents on his own or something like that because I wasn't able to see Rip Rogers' tweet, so I never even saw where this thing started. But Randy Orton was finishing up his SmackDown tour or WWE's tour overseas, he saw the tweet by Rip Rogers, and he retweeted it, and then the fans went ape shit on him, including Bubba Ray Dudley. And Bubba wasn't the only one either. I think Loki even chimed in and said something insulting to Randy Orton. And then Randy Orton proceeded to tweet one of the funniest things I've ever read. And I'm going to pull it up here on the screen. I had it here, and I lost it. But um, it was uh, pretty entertaining what Randy Orton said. Both what him and Rip Rogers said was very good, although I can argue both sides of this. Uh, I did get a kick out of what Randy Orton said. So he says... 
I really need to issue an apology. And then he types up what he says on the notes on his phone and he posts the screenshot. Sorry to the indie marks, indie guys, and old timers who do dives took offense. Just having a good time over a few drinks in Denmark closing out the SmackDown Live tour. While beating Raw and making over $5 million in the last 11 shows. Now I know to some that doesn't equate to a standing room only crowd of 150 people paying $8 in an armory somewhere. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, but in big boy world, that's called putting asses in seats. So so enjoy your flips, dives, and 20 super kicks per match to each their own. I will go dive back into my 13th title run and get ready to flip when my bank statement comes this month. Dot, 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 dot headlock. Oh my god, that was hilarious. So, you know, to me, this was just entertaining. I really didn't care enough to take sides in this. What Rip Rogers said, even though I think the guy's an idiot and a dumbass for blocking me, there was some truth into what he said. And I can also argue against what he said as well. Same goes for Randy Orton. Randy Orton should know by now that in today's day and age of WWE, the only thing putting asses in seats is WWE. No individual wrestlers really draw anymore unless you're maybe Brock Lesnar or a special attraction type guy. These days, people are coming to see the WWE show and product, not the individual wrestler themselves, at least for the most part. And overseas, it's a different deal. There's a lot of sellout crowds over there because WWE rarely goes over there. They only go once or twice a year. So they can always count on huge crowds with a huge ticket gate and all of that. And you really don't get that here in the United States. Some of their house shows only draw one or 2,000 people, where when they go overseas, their house shows could draw fifteen to 20,000 people. So it's a big difference. So for Randy Orton to say he's the one putting the asses in the seats is not entirely accurate there. But what he said in general I thought was great. And I thought he won that argument hands down. So, you know, to me it was all in good fun. Uh, there was even a uh, picture on Twitter up after SmackDown of Randy Orton standing backstage with Drew Gulak. And they were standing by a sign that said no fly zone. I thought that was kind of funny. Me personally, I never get tired of seeing these little Twitter wars whenever they pop up. We get them from time to time between wrestlers and talent and, and people in the business and everything and it's definitely uh one of those popcorn moments so this was pretty fun to watch both guys made some good points and uh, it got a chuckle out of me so that's all i really care about there so anyway i guess that's it for this week like i said i want to get back to working on all the other projects that i'm working on and get that done and out of my life so i can start working on my q a coming to you in the next few weeks here so leave me all your questions comments predictions for backlash down below and i will be back up here on sunday night to give you a review of the backlash pay-per-view. So I will catch you guys in just a couple of days. Until then, peace.